Welcome to Don't Fear the Weight podcast with your host Vicky Masita, bringing together science and personal experience. Guys, welcome back to the next episode of the Don't Fear the Weight podcast. I am your tiny titan host in the swivelly chair of knowledge, as you can see here. I, <laughs> I am Vicky Masita, as always, and I never ever change. I've just actually noticed my camera angle does actually look at Wonder Woman's backside, so I do apologise about that. However, um, you know, it's actually quite a good opening into the subjects that we're going to be talking about today. And in the hot seat, I have got an amazing, beautiful person by the name of Amelia Thompson, PhD. Good evening. How are you, my lovely? I am well. I'm enjoying this view of Wonder Woman's bum, actually. I, I noticed that when I signed in. <laughs> it's one of those I have. It was one of my wonderful competitors who actually competed last year. And um, everybody used, well, my nickname is the Tiny Titan, but a lot of people used to call me Wonder Woman. So I had obviously, you know, the belt and the T-shirt and things like that. So he decided to get me this big canvas which has now got pride of place in my little office working, but just the way that I'm sat and the angle that it's at, we're, we're not actually seeing that it's Wonder Woman, but we're seeing a bum instead, but never mind, never mind. <laughs> so what I brought um, Amelia on today um, to talk about, well, first of all, I want you to introduce yourself, but what we are going to talk about is a lot to do with people's perceptions in the industry, in the fitness industry, um, about what they see on social media, um, how it does influence your ways of eating, how it influences your ways of of maybe progressing yourself in the gym, um, and then how we actually transition out of that progression. So you can be absolutely awesome on everything that you do on stage, but then what happens after that? And that's the conversation that we're gonna get into today. But for people who have been living under a rock for the last uh, kind of uh, six months, Amelia, do you just wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what your background is in? Sure, so I am a nutrition consultant. Um, in a nutshell, I work predominantly online as a consultant and uh, work with some companies in, in nutrition. But predominantly what I do is work with individuals trying to improve their food relationships in some way or another. You know, I do the, all the basic body composition stuff as well, but I do a lot of work in terms of um, mindfulness-based eating, intuitive eating, etc., cetera, um, to try and improve people's food relationships. And a lot of those people are competitors or people that have come from a very rigid dieting background who have slight disordered eating habits so we're not talking you know clinical disordered eating here but we're talking about people that have slight disordered eating habits I tend to work with a lot of people like that not solely but a lot of people like that and um, but my background is I used to compete so I don't compete anymore but I competed for five years um, and I finished with PCA um, in 2017, so I've done, I'm done now. Um, and my PhD is in exercise physiology, and then I started teaching in sports nutrition. So I was a lecturer in sports nutrition, and I still do that um, kind of on an ad hoc basis. So yeah, kind of varied background, but predominantly now working online with mostly disordered eating, but not all. <laughs> cool, cool. So just backtracking a little bit then. So you have obviously been a uh, bikini competitor, Yep. Um, and you competed for five years. Did you compete year on year for those five years or did you have breaks as well? I competed uh, year on year, actually. So I competed the first time with a coach in my first show, which was great. Um, and then I did kind of half an off season with him. And then I went off and did it on my own for the next four years. So I self prepped from that point onwards. Um, there were a few shows that I pulled out of. Um, yep. But no, I did compete at least one show every year. Um, that's a lot isn't it it's, it's quite a hard toll on your body especially as a bikini competitor as well yeah and in my final year I did I you know I did one show in April one show in two shows in May back to back and then I held off until June for finals so and then I was supposed to do another one for team GB like two months later but I, I pulled out because it's too much. As Absolutely, well. definitely. So going back onto those shows then, um, because we're going to be talking about disordered eating and, and obviously the transition from it, um, were you a flexible dieter or did your coach have you um, following a rigid plan that, that you had to stick to? The first time I competed, I followed a plan. Um, yeah. It wasn't it wasn't like really bro, but it was a meal plan. You know, it was the same thing every day. And I did exactly the same thing every day for 10 weeks, pretty much. Um, and it was great at the time. Um, at that time, I don't think anybody really flexible dieted ever. It was mm. um, quite a long time ago. Um, so like seven years and flexible dieting for competing was like a no-no at that point. 
Um, and then after that, from basically my first off season, I went straight into flexible dieting. Um, so because I prepped myself, I just knew that I couldn't do this rigid structure anymore. I found it really hard after my first show, after a rigid structure. I did the classic, you know, shoe box under my bed filled with chocolate and Reese's and all of the stuff that everyone does in their first show, which we tell them not to do, but we do it anyway. Sure. And all of that. So I needed to figure out a way of how to do it, how to do it without that side of things or minimizing that side of things. Amazing. And that's the reason why you went into flexible dieting, learning a little bit more about macronutrients and how to track those. And you tracked it via MyFitnessPal, right? Yeah. And the thing is as well, obviously, so I did a master's in sport and exercise nutrition. So I know all about food. And when I did my first prep, I knew all about food. I know how I knew what, how to track macros, but I just didn't know that it was okay to do that for a bodybuilding show because I didn't know anything about it. And nobody would ever say that they did flexible dieting for bodybuilding at that point. So I knew that I could do it outside of bodybuilding, but I thought for bodybuilding, you had to do it in that way. It's silly when I look at back at it, but at the time I just sort of thought, I'll just do what my coach tells me. And he was a good coach, so I did. Absolutely. And, it's, and there's nothing wrong with that at the end of the day, is there? There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. So, okay, so let's fast forward then to the end of the all um, competing season. What made you decide to realistically give up competing? So I did a really, I had a really, really good year of competing. I'd won Saxon, I'd won Body Power, I'd competed with Team GB, and then I came second at British Finals. And so I had a really good year. I was beaten in, in uh, British Finals by a girl who, who's now actually one of my clients, but she's 22. Right. And I, I, at that point, was 30. And I just kind of thought, I can't compete at this point now moving forward, especially with PCA because they like quite a lot of muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and I just knew that I couldn't compete with younger girls realistically um, with my muscle mass. And I wasn't willing to do what needed to be done, really. I didn't want to do that to put my body through a certain amount of things that needed to be done to get that muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And so... I just thought mm, I'm, my values have shifted a little bit. I care about my health and competing doesn't necessarily align with health all the time as we know. Um, and so it was just one of those things where I thought I've done as best as I possibly can do and I want to focus on my health and so I stepped back from it. And it's, I, I'm not 100% no, but I'm like 95% probably not going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 95. There's always that little slim yeah. chance that you might do it. Well, I think it's one of those things, isn't it? Once you, you're a competitor, you're always a competitor and you can be a competitor at heart um, mm -hmm. and you're always going to carry that around with you. So, OK, so so let's like um, move swiftly on then. So you obviously did um, If It Fits Your Macros and um, you made sure that everything was all flexible and you made sure that you weren't going to have these cravings and then transitioning out of the show. So really getting into the nitty gritty of how did you walk away from my fitness pal or did you or didn't you you know what is it that you did in order to make sure that you could have a quote unquote lifestyle of normality <laughs> after bodybuilding so i actually stepped away from my fitness pal in probably my second off season so i was intuitively eating so to speak after a couple of seasons of competing um because I needed a break from it. I am not, I don't enjoy that really rigid structure for too long. So I know some competitors, they love to be, you know, really anal about their my fitness pal 12 months a year, but I didn't really enjoy that. So, and because I have a background of quite disordered eating habits that I had before I started competing, I found like many competitors do, I found off seasons quite hard and I had no guidance and I didn't know that that was normal at the time again that seven years ago nobody said you can expect that the off your off season is going to be really hard nobody nobody tells you that and yeah. so for me it was about finding my feet and and I basically did what we do and we I just delved into research and thought what what research is there that shows certain types of eating habits are better for you know binge type eating behaviors and I found a lot of work on mindfulness based eating and intuitive eating and the success around binge eating and so the way that I found easiest to go into intuitive eating was that the evidence was there and because I'm a scientist I thought that the evidence is there I'm going to trust it and so it's quite it was easier for me to step away from my fitness pal than maybe some other people and the clients that I work with I know how difficult it is to step away from it um, so I maybe found it a little bit easier for that reason. I, I trust science. I'm like, if it says it on the paper and the p-value is less than 0 0.05, I'm going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked for me. Um, so And then obviously when I came off competing uh, at PCA at finals, I was not tracking within a few days. 
um, and that's based on previous previous um, post shows that I've done where I've tried to do the classic reverse diet mm -hmm. um, and we know reverse dieting can be tough for people with any sort of binge eating habits so trying to still follow a regimented schedule is quite tough when you're that hungry um, and you don't have that timeline anymore so I know personally for myself that it's not beneficial for me to reverse diet so I just immediately stopped um, and I just went straight into intuitive eating. There's a lot of like basic approaches you can do, and that's what I do tend to do with more client with my clients. Um, but for me, I just I found it really quite easy just to go enough is enough and stopped. <laughs> yeah, for sure, definitely. So let's dive into that phasic kind of transition. So, um, like say for example, your your competitor that you've got with you now, who um, beat you in the finals, um, she's obviously a lot younger. Did she come to you with some kind of disordered eating habits previously, and then they just carried on after the show, or were they exacerbated by doing the show? No, so like I said, so not all my clients have got binge eating. Some of them mm. want to, you know, have a healthier, happier relationship, but their values have shifted a little bit. And she's one of those people. She's just shifted her values a little bit. Um, but clients who do want to transition into more intuitive approaches, regardless of whether they're binge eaters or or not, or they're healthy and they just want to intuitively eat. Um, like I said, there's that kind of basic approach. So they tend to come to me really, really restricted on their on their MyFitnessPal. And so I generally don't have clients start off immediately intuitive. I generally will start them with their macros just to, to get them to a basic maintenance point. Um, after years and years of dieting, we know that our hunger signals and our fullness signals are quite off. Um, we don't know how to tell when we're hungry and we don't know how to tell when we're full anymore. Yeah. Um, and we've all been through that from living out of Tupperware for however many years. Mm -hmm. We just on our in, our in our tub and that's what we're supposed to do um so the one of the first things that i'll do is is whilst they're tracking look at their mindfulness skills so looking at their ability to tune into their hunger and we'll use like utilize different scales so like hunger scales building scales around meals and at different times of the day and um, whilst they'll show whilst they're still tracking so that it gives them some sort of confidence to say, actually, I'm starting to learn when I'm actually hungry and I don't need to finish what's on my plate anymore. Um, and as they start to do that, then they realize they don't want to finish what's on their plate. So their macros are going to be off. So they don't want to be attached to the macros anymore. Um, and that gives them a little bit of a drive. So then you can start removing macros. So instead of having, you know, carbs, protein and fat, you can do things like removing the carbs and fat targets. So you just have to track protein and calories which we'll do sometimes with clients anyway, um, as you know. And then doing things like, you know, you're going to track 80% of your day, but then you're going to have a meal at night where you're just not going to track it and you're going to base on protein or you're going to take one day off at the weekend. And for some people, it's really easy and they fall straight into it. Other people, it's a lot more difficult and you can do things like you're just not going to enter into my fitness pal. You can eat the same thing that you always eat but you're just not going to put it in your phone. And even that is really hard for some people. Like they say, oh, well, I've got a 465 day streak on my fitness pal. And I'm yeah. like, that's not a goal in life. That's no. <laughs> so well, it's, everyone's different in how, how well they take to it. But I think it's a really important goal for people to have, especially competitors in their off season, really learning how to feel hungry and full again is really important. Our bodies are designed to do that. Um, and of course you're going to go back to tracking or meal plan when you compete but everyone should have an off season where that's a focus because there's so much more to life <laughs> that you miss isn't there just mm. yeah definitely and I think one of those things as well is it's going to take so much more emotional stress off you if you can just get away from my fitness pal mm. people don't actually assume like like in their off season they really want to make the progress like say for example they want to build some more muscle mass in order to build more muscle mass, your stress levels have got to be super, super, super low. And the only time that you want that cortisol to be really high is in the gym when you're really kind of pushing it to make those numbers and to make that muscular um, that muscular increase. But if you're constantly stressing over a, a few grains of rice that you've dropped out of your Tupperware or a potato that fell on the floor or your cat that ate your chicken breast, mm -hmm. you know, and then, oh my God, what the hell are you going to do? You're never really going to make that progress. So like you said, just kind of maybe omitting a few macros here and there every day or even just not putting it in your phone. It can almost be like, like heightened anxieties, right? Mm -hmm. Have you seen people who have that really kind of anxious, oh my God, kind of feeling when you say don't, just don't track a meal? Yeah, and I've had people that I say, right, that's your target for the week, one one meal, and you're not going to track it, and they come back and say, I tracked it. 
I tried yeah. to not do it. It's like, okay, we need to work on this because people miss out. It's people miss out on you know socializing, and we know those people that that don't go out for dinner because they can't track it. And that's that's the last thing you want in off season. If you want to prep, you have to give a hundred percent to your prep, and you know yeah. that you miss out on a lot. Um, if you're doing that twelve months of a year if, for four years, five years, that's a hell of a lot of life that you, you don't get to have just because you're attached to my fitness pal. And and when people start to do it more and more, they realize actually it makes zero difference, you know, to their body weight or their measurements, or actually they feel better because they're, like you said, they're less stressed. Um, then they're much more inclined to do it again. And you obviously get that positive reinforcement, but it's it's scary for a lot of people, a lot of people, and they're not just competitors, people that are chronic dieters, they just mm. try it. And it's, I've been there, we, like you, I'm sure you've been there. It's, it is, it's hard to get out of it. Definitely, it is. Because it, people use it as a crutch. You know, some people use um, alcohol, some people use um, smoking, some people use chocolate. Other people use my fitness pal because it's their form of control. Mm. So, and there's, it's, I love the fact that you are actually using the terminology of disordered eating rather than actually using the terminology of an eating disorder. We are not talking about fully blown, um, clinically diagnosed eating disorders here, like anorexia or bulimia or anything like that. This is about disordered eating. Um, and some of that disordered eating is, of course, being attached to my fitness pal for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and actually getting those anxieties when you can't be attached to it. So it's really important that people actually know that we are differentiating between those two um those two diagnoses or two words um so okay so let's move on to um flexible dieting and the social media aspect of things so um i look at your stories for example and today i saw that you had a big bowl of soup with cheese on toast <laughs> my god sacrilege fats and carbs oh. together what is that about <laughs> So, but what would you say is one of your biggest beefs with social media and what you see in the flexible dieting realm of uh, social media? Ooh, good question. Mm. Um, I think this comes down to not just the flexible dieting realm. I think this comes down to social media and it's dishonesty. It's yep. complete dishonesty. So I obviously share, I, try, I don't share everything that I eat because I don't think people need to see everything that I eat. But I will try and share, if I have chocolate, I'll share chocolate. If I have egg white omelette, I'll share egg white omelette as much as I can because that's what flexible dieting actually is. It's yeah. a combination of lean and low calorie foods probably and more calorie dense foods. And my issue, I suppose, is when people share just the calorie dense side of things or they share just, they're just dishonest or they are, they claim to be very honest and they claim to be very real but they're still dishonest, they're even worse. That's like a subgroup of dishonesty in social media. Yeah. Um, and it's, not just come, it's not just dieting, it's it's the whole realm of social media. Um, I do think that as a as a, a social media has come on, people have this expectation now though, that people are honest or should be honest. And I think that that's an issue in itself. I don't think people should expect people to be honest. Nobody has to be. Um, but I think that dishonesty, and, and kind of showing just what you want to show is quite infuriating. But definitely, everyone's allowed to show what they want. And I, and I do think the responsibility, of course, is on, on people to follow the right people as much as they can. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. That was one of my things that I was actually going to bring up about the fact that a lot of people do actually say, you know, oh, this annoys me and that annoys me and this gets uh, this bit and this get that bit. But the thing is, is that we are all responsible adults at the end of the day. And um, in terms of being a responsible adult, you can choose whether you can follow that person or not. And if you don't like the way that they're doing something, then just unfollow them. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do to not be exposed to these kind of things on social media. But I think I did, um, I am agreeing with you in terms of the people who are literally just showing the, the quote unquote cheat foods all the time, you know, because that's all they ever do. But what they don't actually see is that that big cheat meal that takes like 2000 calories of their, of their daily intake for the remainder of the day, they're starving yeah. <laughs> and they literally don't eat anything. Or like you were saying, you know, they have their egg white omelets and they have nothing else apart from that. Or they're just a chicken and lettuce and things like, you know, things along those lines. So, um, but what do you actually think that that, um, the social media cues that we've just been talking about, what do you think that that does to the person who doesn't understand about flexible dieting? What do you think that influences them to do? I just think, I just think confusion in general in terms of nutrition at the moment is so rife. Um, and I and I think seeing 
messages like that, they either, you know, people with disordered eating habits, they see things like that and they think like, oh, well, I can eat like that. And then they just feel guilty for doing it because these people have maybe gone a little bit OTT on eating a full pizza, which to be fair, I will do. But yeah. they, see that and they think, right, I'm going to do that too. And then they feel guilty and then it exacerbates their own issues. Um, but I just think confusion in general with nutrition, you know it as well as I do. It's just it's just awful. Um, but, you know, when I put things up, say I put a large Domino's up, which, like I said, I will eat it. I will get at least five to ten messages from from girls saying, "Do do you just taste that and then do you give it to someone else?" Do you? I've had that so many times, and I and and that's and that's an issue in itself that because of this kind of fakeness that people are putting out, that you do get these women and men who put things like that up but don't eat it. Um, they then think that that's what everyone does, and it's like, no, I paid twenty quid for this pizza. I mean, yeah. <laughs> if I don't eat today, I'll eat it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and I and I think it just it just confuses people, and and people don't know, really know where to look for the right information as much. Mm. As mm. Think, yeah, it's funny when you said that. You know, about do you just kind of lick it and then put it down? You know, I I gave a consult to somebody today who actually said that it was the very same thing for three years. She couldn't eat chocolate, so all she did was like put it in her mouth, chew it, and then spit it out. Oh goodness. I know. God, but again, this is the thing. This is, and this is the disordered eating that we're talking about. People will look at that and think, oh, I just don't want to eat it, so I'm just not going to eat it. But doing that consecutively for three years, that is a level of disordered eating. Um, just like not being able to go out for dinner, just like freaking out about my fitness battles, all the sort, some level on the spectrum of disordered eating, which is scary. And if everyone looked at themselves and looked at their own eating habits, they'd probably fall somewhere on that spectrum. Scary. It is very, very scary. Um, it, it, and it is, it's so, it's, sometimes you kind of think to yourself, I'm gonna have to scratch my head and just kind of think, why, why? Just don't eat it then, don't eat it. But if anything, we're actually taking, we're actually taking the piss out of this as well sometimes because have you seen some of the gym memes that they have or, or like diet memes where these girls are saying that they're on completely low carb and, and all they're doing is like smashing their face or rubbing their faces with a with a piece of bread and stuff like that and it's just like this is actually taking the piss out of something that's actually very very real hmm. and it's what people don't realize that that's what's going on and, and this kind of thing is rife in the industry so um i mean if you are picking up a piece of bread and just kind of smelling it and then putting it to one side there's something wrong there <laughs> yeah. there's something yeah. wrong and that's something i try and make people do is just question why they're doing something mm. why, why are why do you just stare at the food cupboard for 10 minutes are you hungry or or you know is there something else going on or why do you eat past the point of fullness or why do you ex completely exclude that food group and it's it usually comes back to some something that's nothing to do with hunger it's like food is food is to be enjoyed and food is to help you stop being hungry and it has a purpose and these types of rules that we develop over time from obscure sources are they're rife and everyone has some sort of weird food rule and and it's some it's a shame that it's exacerbated by social media or really awful nutrition advice from people that are not qualified and and I have had quite a few clients who have come from personal trainers with no nutrition background at all who have told them the classic crap of not eating, you know, carbs and fat at the same meal, not having carbs at breakfast. And these people have come to me with eating disorders to the point yeah. where I've had to refer them to, to a specialist dietitian for an eating disorder because they've come from a background of a such utter bollocks nutrition advice, be that from social media or a personal trainer. And I say personal trainers, I'm not brandishing personal trainers with bad nutrition advice. I'm talking about the select few that have come to me from personal trainers. And it's it's just, it's, you know, we people make a joke of it on social media, but it's like everything, right? Social media memes make a joke of everything from self-deprecation to, well, everything. I saw a meme recently and it was like, it basically made a meme out of depression and it was, it was funny and it was self-deprecating and it was about self-sabotage and, you know... <laughs> It's really hard because I look at the self-sabotage memes and I laugh because I think that's what I do. But it's yeah. just serious as nutrition. But we can take nutrition seriously because we're nutritionists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there's nothing wrong with kind of like having a lighter aspect on things or a lighter view on things because it's, I always have this kind of thing that I say it's hippie woo-woo shit, right? And hippie woo-woo shit um, is just something that I say appreciate everything that goes on around you, including like, you know, going out for a 10-minute walk in the morning just to kind of clear your head and listen. don't listen to anything apart from the birds, the bees, the dogs barking, everything that's in nature because it really does set you up neurologically. 
for a really bloody good day. Um, but you can see the funny side of that because sometimes I walk out in the day and um, or in the morning and I've got my dog and, and as we're walking around, I'm just in the middle of this really nice hippie woo woo shit story that I'm putting on there and he just wants to kind of like squat and have a shit. And it's like, <laughs> Okay. Well, now I am one with nature because I'm not only like hearing the birds, the bees, but I'm also smelling the shit. <laughs> so, you know, it, you can make light of, of these kind of things. But it's like you're saying, because we're nutritionists and we look at the science and the scientific evidence and where it's all backed up just because you are entrusting yourself with a personal trainer. And like we said, we're, we're not tarnishing everybody with the same brush. But just because somebody looks the part does not mean that you have to trust them. Mm -hmm. You know, would you trust somebody walking around a hospital um, wearing a white coat just because he's wearing a white coat? You might, actually, which is Yeah, exciting. you might. <laughs> you might. But that's the problem. That guy could have just kind of walked in and then grabbed a, a hook off the or coat off the hook rail or something like that and then just, you know, walked around a hospital. He could be stealing babies. You don't know. Yeah, I know. And it's, and it's hard because people don't know who to trust. And I think... I used I used to be wary of calling people out and I used to be wary of calling out the crap and I was very much about I want to just be positive all the time and try and promote positive message but actually it comes to a point where you go I actually do have to call this stuff out because mm -hmm. this is bollocks and it's hurting people um, and I don't think enough people I don't think there are enough people doing that um, in, a, in a positive way we've got the classic examples you know like James Smith for example who does a great job in his demographic of calling it out but I don't think as a collective nutritionist, I think struggle a lot with their confidence and their and I've noticed this a lot and we a lot of us will suffer from imposter spectrum or imposter syndrome. So I don't know if you if you've experienced that yourself, but it's withholds a lot of people from from speaking out and calling people out and it's really rife in nutrition for some reason. It's why we don't get a lot of outly outwardly spoken women in nutrition. You know, there are many of us that will go out and say this stuff is, is bollocks um, because we all have this kind of imposter syndrome going on and it's a shame because it, it skews the messages that get out there. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's very, very true what you're saying about women in the industry as well, because I don't think there are a lot of women in the industry. And like you were saying there, it's one of the, the main reasons why I started this podcast was because I was so sick and tired of not having any answers um, mm -hmm. out in the out in the field there, because obviously within scientific research, it's never done on women because we have too many variables that, that need to be considered, like, you know, hormones and that, because we have a thousand different hormones that need to be taken into consideration, whereas men have one. Um, so there's there's no kind of spikes, mids or troughs. Um, so I was so sick and tired of just trying to trawl things that I just thought, you know what, I'm just gonna find it out myself and just call these people out. And that's the reason why I'm so very privileged to speak to people in the industry like yourself um, and like other people um, who are delving into the scientific methods. And I'm saying, well, what about women? And people are like, um, um, well, I, I don't know about women. It's like, well, you know, we've known this for years because we're women ourselves and, and women's brains work a hell of a lot differently than men's work. And that, I think, in the nutritional industry does not be, is not being taken into um, account either. Yeah. Um, do you work predominantly with women or do you have men on your books as well? I have some male clients, um, but I'm, most of my clients are women. Um, but I do have some male clients, some who are competitors and some who are not. Um, so I have, a, I have a mix, but most of them are women. Um, and yeah, of course, we work with them in very different ways. They're very different. Um, what, what do you find is one of the biggest things mentality wise with men? I mean, I'm assuming that, and I am big, this is a massive assumption and I'm sorry because I should never bloody assume, <laughs> but um, do your men, are they just the body aesthetics guys and the transformation ones or have they come into a background of uh, disordered eating and they want to go transition into the mindfulness? Most of my male clients are um, want to improve their food relationships in some way. Not all of them, but most of them do, and they tend to be they tend to come to me as a last resort. You know, because traditionally we know, you know, it's harder for men to talk about their feelings. We know that male suicide rates higher. All of these things we know this. So, I think that for for them to come to me, somebody who says, right, we're going to meditate. They they, ha they they feel like they're at the last kind of resort and they want to try things and they, they do say that to me. Um, so, yeah, they do want to improve their food relationships and they do the same sort of similar methods. You know, yes, there are less considerations in terms of hormonal fluctuations and we know that with women, you know, binge eating might increase around certain times of the month and things and men don't have that. Um, but, you know, they're, the same processes still apply, the same mindfulness approaches and things still apply. Um, but you're completely right. There's not... 
there isn't a lot of research on women. Um, mm. you know, of course, there are some. And what I really like about the mindfulness research is that it was in women um, and in overweight women and obese women. So it's it's nice that it's so applicable. Um, but you're right, there, is, there isn't a lot and there aren't a lot of strong, outspoken, well-known women in our in our industry at this point. I think that's good. It's start, starting to change. And I, what I love about Martin McDonald is that he really champions women and he pushes women to be more confident in themselves. And I really, and I, and I think he's doing a good job at that. I think there are some really strong women coming through, which is nice. Evidence. Yeah, definitely. Good. Big old shout out to Martin. We love you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> he is a really good guy. I've had him on the podcast a couple of times. So um, he is, and he's very, very outspoken. He's very direct and to the point, and he's got no bullshit. And he's got no time for bullshit either. And that's what I really love about him. And I think that's what I uh, that's what I treasure about myself because I actually say that I am a no bullshit approach coach. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are honest with me, then I will be honest with you and I can help. But if you just kind of like turn your back on me and not speak to me throughout the process then that's something that I can't do I can't help because I don't I can't help what I don't know what's going on yeah you know and I think that comes part and parcel with men as well as women because men can be very very embarrassed about having disordered eating or having eating disorders so they just want to kind of keep quiet and sit in a corner and rock and just feel that that's going to be all right for them and um, one of a, a, another biggest thing that I've been seeing on social media quite a lot actually with, with disordered eating in men is that they tend not to actually have a lot of savory meals have you come across anyone like that what as in men with disordered eating tend not to have savory meals yeah they're just not having savory meals it's almost like they're from morning through to night they will be having like say for example their breakfast is loaded with um sweet things so fruit and um chocolate and fruity pebbles and that kind of thing and then they'll have the same thing for a pre-workout and then they'll have um things like i don't know rice cakes and like a sweet yogurt um with another bowl of oats for afterward who just had like really nice sweet things all the way through the day but didn't actually have any kind of um, meat or vegetables or potatoes or rice or anything like that. So they didn't have this whole array of nice, colorful um, vitamins, minerals, anything else like that. And I find that that's quite a nice cover up for somebody who does have almost a disordered eating, who wants all of these nice little bits and bobs, but doesn't almost, almost doesn't want to venture into the quote unquote too clean realm for fear of maybe going too clean. Do you, does mm. that make sense? Yeah, so I haven't noticed that necessarily in men, but a lot of the males that I work with, actually most of them have got wives or partners and i don't know if that maybe influences their eating habits in the sense that, that in a stereotypical way that they you know they eat with their their wife or their wife cooks dinner etc so that might potentially influence it a little bit um what i do find though is that it's probably on the same sort of lines where people use my fitness pal as a sort of mask for their disordered eating in the sense of they think that it, they blame disordered eating on their, they blame their disordered eating on my fitness pal, and um, so that's that is one not necessarily in men, but in general that I do find I do come across. But I don't think I've ever come across people that predominantly don't eat kind of meals. But it might just be because a lot of the women I work with have come from that chronic dieting background, so they've got some sort of meal structure in place already that they they can't get out of, and that's potentially what is contributing to their disordered eating in the first place. Yeah, for sure. No, totally understand that one. So it's almost like the fact like we were talking about can't combine carbs and fats at the same meal, for example, because that's how you get fat. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are dealing with a lot of women who say won't venture out to different meals, so say if they have mm -hmm. chicken, sweet potato and broccoli, they will not, for God forbid, have chicken and rice and mm. asparagus for example even though it can be the same macronutrient breakdown um but they just can't have that because it's not on plan yeah yeah and it's just that breaking away from the plan isn't it and or my fitness pal or the meal plan or whatever it is um yeah exactly so um i mean I, i'm aware and conscious that we are taking up quite a lot of your time here so but i do have a couple more questions that i obviously want to ask you and things um in terms of mindful eating now i don't want you to give away all of your tips and tricks of course um but if uh, what i would um ask you is if you had the top three tips that you could give anybody to walk away from my fitness pal um what would it be and how would they implement them Okay, to walk away from my fitness pal, the first one would be to incorporate mindful eating. So you can do that by taking your time to eat meals. So taking 10, 10 15 minutes to eat a meal each day. Um, you can do it by removing distractions from when you eat. So 
you should be having a meal a day that doesn't require your phone or the TV or, or anything else that's going on or a book or your desk. So incorporating mindful eating into one meal a day is a great place to start. Um, challenging yourself to removing your carbon fat macros is quite an easy one. Although mm. that still does require my fitness pal to start with, um, it loosens off the rigidity in terms of the numbers. Um, and so it allows you to still track but with less specificity so first tip in transitioning out of my fitness pal would be to incorporate mindful eating into one meal a day so tuning into the meal that you're eating so mindfulness around a meal just means paying attention without judgment um, to what you're doing in a nutshell so paying attention to your meal with no distractions and uh, no phones no tvs nothing no desk um, and also taking 10 to 15 minutes to eat that meal so really slowing down paying attention to the, the you know the sight flavors tastes etc sometimes that's really challenging for people to do but just one meal a day and um, so that's the first thing second thing is if you're tracking your carbs and your fats as well as your protein and calories remove that so just focus on hitting your protein targets each day and hitting your calories and um, allow those macros and your carbs and fat to, to vary and get used to those numbers not really aligning to anything just getting used to them being a little bit off or a little bit different is a really good tool to do and um, third step is you can depend on how bold you feel removing a whole meal from tracking so say right for, for this week i'm not going to track my dinner i'm going to allow my macros to be off it's going to freak me out and it's not going to align to my targets but i'm going to do it anyway um, and removing a meal or go for a full day and say right i'm not going to track all day on saturday and see how it goes and then you can just kind of progress it from there so you know increase your mindful meals to two meals a day or increase your track untracked meals to two meals a day or your days to two days a week and then just kind of phase it out that way okay that's really really good tips as well okay so very last question and the question that i ask absolutely everybody at the end of these shows is if you could pick three amazing scientific minds that you could sit down and have a mindful dinner with who would they be amazing scientific minds so my friend actually told me that you you always ask this question so i was, I was listening to one <laughs> I always ask this question and i thought about it and I thought right if I get asked evidence-based people this is who I'll say and I'll probably judge on it but you know how busy we are as people okay we are very busy people and I thought the people I want to hang out with are evidence-based people that I don't have time to see so my three evidence-based people are people that probably not that many people might know but that's okay and um, my two best two of my best friends who are evidence-based nutritionists so uh, Dan and Mike, who are coaches, who I don't get to see very often because they're down in Bath, they have a coaching company, uh, business, Biceps and Banner. I don't know if you're aware of them, but they're very evidence-based and they're great. Um, and the third one is Luke, Muscle Mentors Luke, who you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, again, don't have time to catch up with them. And they're all evidence-based. And I would rather eat with them than, <laughs> than a big scientific person who wants to talk about research all the time. <laughs> I know, it's, I know it's bad, but that's a genuine answer. It's who I'd rather sit and like, have pizza with. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's great. You don't have to just like, kind of surround yourself with people just to be educated all the time. Sometimes you just want to kind of sit down and shoot the shit with people. Exactly that. You know? And it's, it's lovely to do that, you know, because that, it still brings enjoyment to your food at the same time, doesn't it? Exactly. And yeah. everyone else, I can hang out with them at conferences and, you know, networking. <laughs> exactly right exactly so amelia where can people find you and um send you a message if they need you i am most um easily found on instagram so my instagram handle is amelia thompson phd um and i answer i try and answer all my dms on there so I try and answer everything on there yeah i do <laughs> yeah you do. Okay. Um, cool so i'll make sure that that link is underneath here and guys and girls if you do have any questions for amelia or myself then please 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 put them in the comment section underneath the box here and we will get back to them as soon as we possibly can all right so um that is it for another episode of don't fear the way podcast with me your host vicky misita and my wonderful guest amelia thompson so make sure that you give her a follow because um she does have a lot of interesting stuff that you need to be following at this point all right my guys so thank you very much amelia i'm sorry about all of the internet kerfuffle um <laughs> we will catch up again very very soon okay thank you take care bye